our new school year. So if you would take a seat, we would be very appreciative. As you are seated, I want to invite our missionary on campus this semester, Mike Ackerman, who comes to us from Japan to the stage. And in just a moment, he's going to, you bet, welcome Mike. And in just a moment, he's going to word our opening prayer. Welcome to the 2012-2013 school year at Ozark Christian College. We have a lot of new students. In fact, uh, our new academic dean, Doug Aldridge, uh, texted me late this afternoon and said that as of right now, it's not a final number, but uh, we have 702 students enrolled. And so we are rejoicing. A scripture as we begin this school year and as we begin this service tonight. Psalm 119, verse 12. says, Praise be to you, O Lord, and teach me your decree. This year we hope, our prayer is that the Lord would teach us his decrees, his word. But before we do that, it is good and it is right for us to praise him, to worship him. Before the, sanctuary, before the classroom comes the sanctuary. And tonight, uh, as we gather, as we fellowship over the tables and the food, our hearts will be drawn to worship. A great way to begin a school year. So join me right now as we bow in prayer as Mike comes to lead us. Let's pray. God, as we formally begin this school year, just as President Proctor said, I pray that you would help our hearts and minds be oriented and postured towards worship. I pray that as we sing songs of praise, as we hear from your word, and even as we share a meal together, that our, our hearts would be lifted to you. And as we begin classes tomorrow, I just pray that that, that would be the tone that we continue to sing, that it would be a, a year of worshiping you. And through our studies, through our relationships with one another, through our service, that would, it would all be praise. Help us to just draw near to you, to depend on you, to pursue you, captivate our hearts. And I just pray that you would shape us into the people that you would have us to be so that we could serve you in this world. Please just bless this food that we're about to eat. Help it to nourish us so we can continue to serve you. And I just pray that you would put your blessing on all the events that happen tonight and that it would truly be pleasing to you and that it would all be in, uh, flowing out of that heart of worship. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you would, remain seated until your table is dismissed. You'll be given instructions on how to get your food. And uh, after uh, you've had a chance to eat, we'll continue with the service. Until then, enjoy the meal. Take off their coats and loosen their ties and roll up their sleeves and live out our motto from Mark 10, 45, not to be served, but to serve. Uh, these are our leaders, but tonight they have been our servants. So would you just express your appreciation to them as well? Tonight is a night of commitment. Another tradition, and a good one, that we have had here at the Convocation Banquet is to culminate our service every year with the giving and the receiving of pledges. The faculty make commitments to you as our students. And you, in turn, as students, make commitments to us as your faculty. And tonight, uh, we will be led in those commitments. The faculty pledge will be led by Professor Chad Ragsdale and Professor Sean Lindsay. And the student pledge will be led by student representatives, Christy Blackman and Chad Pickens. Most eligible bachelor right there, Chad. Now, 
it's very appropriate uh, that Chad will be helping to lead in the student pledge because uh, tonight we also are going to have another uh, commitment, and it's for another cowboy, uh, Doug Aldrich. Uh, Doug is going to be installed tonight as the fifth academic dean of Ozark Christian College, which you understand in a 70-year history is a momentous occasion. This is a special night. And Doug will have an opportunity to speak this evening and to share some of his vision, what God has put on his heart for this school as he assumes this new leadership role. Here tonight to charge him is the fourth academic dean of Ozark Christian College. Dr. Mark Scott is going to give a charge to Doug Aldridge, and we appreciate him making the time uh, with his sweet wife, Carla, to be here with us this evening. I also want to give special recognition to the third academic dean of Ozark Christian College. Dr. Lynn Gardner and his wife, Barbara, are here with us uh, tonight. Would you just wave Dr. Gardner and Barbara over the Actually, uh, Dr. Gardner's son-in-law, Dr. Bob Arntz, is the chairman of our board of trustees. And so uh, at that time in the service, when there is the giving and receiving of commitments, as Doug accepts this new responsibility of leadership in this kingdom endeavor, uh, Dr. Arntz will lead in that commitment. A few other uh, new folks that I'll just mention who are part of our service tonight. We're very glad to have Dell and Kim Camp as our new vet. new residence directors in Dennis Hall. They're going to read scripture and pray here in just a moment after we are led in worship by Scott Handley, the director of our music department. And then to close out this evening, another new face among us, our uh, interim residence director in Strong Hall, Paul Burton. So very good night that the Lord has in store for us. Would you turn your hearts to the Lord right now as Scott comes and leads us. Name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for a beautiful day and I thank you for the many blessings that we uh, enjoy. Father, we know that um, you have brought us all together for a reason. Everyone here has a different story as to how they arrived. Father, I thank you for our speakers today especially. I thank you that um, they are men of integrity and of wisdom and of discipline. Father, you have prepared them for this walk as you have many others who have come this way. Father, I pray right now that um, you would speak through your words and speak through these men to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One week ago, tonight, Ms. Carl and I came back from a missions trip to Ukraine. Ozark Christian College helped us go. You know how these mission trips are. You go intending to bless other people, and you come back with the blessing. That was our situation. And we learned a Russian word while in the Ukraine that we used, you know, just a lot. And it was the word spasiba. Spasiba. It means in Russian, thank you. So I want to say, as I begin my little part, spasiba to Ozark Christian College for helping us go to Ukraine. And I want to say spasiba to Ozark Christian College for the invitation to be part of this very special night. It's, I know, convocation. It's, I know, a new school year. But uh, it's not every beginning of a school year where you install 
a new academic leader. And to have the privilege to be here tonight for my friend, co-worker, Doug Aldridge, is a great honor for Miss Carla and me. And to ensure that this doesn't get lost in the evening, I would like us all to also honor his wife, Georgia, just now. Would you do that? The 70-year history of this college has seen a few changes in the academic dean's uh, office. Our founding dean, Brother Seth Wilson, I would label as a theologian. It's good he's not here tonight because he would not like that label. In fact, he would tell you that the only one who deserves to be a theologian is the devil. He didn't like taming the text. He didn't like uh, keeping it less than raw. He didn't like cramming it into various systems. He would resist that title, but all I mean by it was that he was an outstanding Bible student. In fact, at his funeral, Gibbon Blakely said that Brother Wilson had few peers and no equals when it came to Scripture. Our second academic dean was a man by the name of Wallace Wardick. He was equally a good Bible student, but he was also a linguist. He would uh, go up to room 21 in the missions building, which at one time was a listening lab, and he would do weird things like teach himself other languages and take joy in it. Our third academic dean, as mentioned already tonight, Dr. Lynn Gardner, was what I would label a historian, a very fine historian, with just a skosh of philosopher in him as well. Uh, the fourth one was kind of a half-wit expositor, but the, uh, the one we install tonight, number five, is, as you know, a cowboy. <laughs> Yippee-i-a, we've come a long way. <laughs> but cowboys are good, you know. I haven't really read much of Louis L'Amour, Doug. And I suppose the true American cowboy is somewhere between, you know, uh, Roy Rogers and Clint Eastwood. Somewhere in that spectrum is, I suppose, the true. And if you don't know who Roy Rogers is, repent. Um, I know your generation doesn't know, but how will we ever sing happy trails at your funeral? As they did at Dr. Bob Lowry's funeral, if you don't know something about Roy Rogers. Maybe that's the case. Not, not real sure, but maybe we need a cowboy for such a time as this in the life of the school. So here's the homiletical method tonight. I want to talk about cowboys. I want to talk about Nehemiah. You just heard the first chapter. And then I want to talk about Doug Aldridge. Well, one of the things you note about cowboys is they're tough and tender all at the same time. I mean, these are the guys that uh, sweat it out during the daytime and are cold, sleeping outside at night. You, you grab their hand and it's like shaking sandpaper. These guys are tough. They are weathered. But there's a tender side to cowboys. When their day is over, they can take off that saddle. They can use it as a pillow or a prop. And they'll kind of bang their harmonica and begin to play a tune as they look up at the stars. They have a right brain as well as a left brain. Cowboys are tough and tender. Cow cowboys uh, make good plans. You don't drive a herd of cattle without knowing where the mountain passes are and where the green grass is and where there's water. You gotta make good plans if you're a cowboy. You have to face opposition. I mean, there's lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And um, thieves. And people that will just rip you off. So uh, you have to face opposition if you're a good cowboy. You have to do this. You have to work hard. I've not known too many heavy set cowboys. Have you? I mean, they're wiry little guys. They, they, they may not be very tall, but they can ride the Broncos and they can get on those bulls and they can rope cattle and they work hard. And cowboys also... Uh, 
are willing to make personal sacrifices. They'll probably feed their cow dog and their horse. His name was Trigger, if you don't know. Before uh, they feed themselves. They, they do know something about feeding the herd that they're driving, whether it's to Dodge City or to Garden City or to Fort Worth or to Omaha or to Wichita. They, they know something about getting that herd enough E-series that you're headed into in the chapel services. Reboot, uh, uh, restore, replan, re... You'll be looking at Nehemiah. And uh, Nehemiah, I think this good governor that helped God's people out of exile with Zerubbabel and... Ezra, the good Bible teacher, and Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi. I think Nehemiah was kind of a cowboy. I mean, cowboys ride horses, and Nehemiah rode a donkey. And that's sort of like a horse, you know. <laughs> so I look at this list, and I think, well, Nehemiah's kind of tough and tender. In the 13th chapter, he was pulling other people's hair out. That's fairly aggressive. I mean, to pull your own hair, that's one thing, but to pull other people's hair out, that's pretty tough. But it's also tender. You notice from Kim's reading of the text tonight that uh, he heard that the walls in Jerusalem were down, and he wept. He wept. He could be touched. And uh, Nehemiah made pretty good plans. When he did ride that donkey at night, checking out the walls in chapter 2, he was planning his strategies. He was thinking of how we can build this wall in 52 days. Uh, Nehemiah faced opposition. You remember those three guys, Huey, Dewey, and Louie? They really have names like Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Gresham the Arab. But they said, oh, Nehemiah, just come down to the plain of Odo. And Nehemiah said, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm involved in a great work, and I can't come down. Nehemiah worked hard. Nehemiah had personal sacrifice. Um, Nehemiah said, enough of this usury, enough of this unjustified, you know, causing interest to inflate. No way. And by the way, would you guys like to eat at my table? My food is available to you. That's Nehemiah. He uh, fed his people. This good governor knew something I wish in a political year our country would learn. And that's this, that it takes more than bricks and mortar to rebuild a nation. It takes this book. Because I think one of the greatest verses in all the Bible about the Bible is in this book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 8. I'll never forget when I was doing my oral defense at Denver Seminary, Dr. Kermit Eckelbarger said, what passage of scripture do you think is the best verse on expository preaching? I thought, holy cow, that's not my topic. <laughs> but uh, I said, I guess Nehemiah 8, 8. He said, I've always thought so myself. three great Hebrew verbs, they translated the text and gave the meaning so the people could understand. That's feeding the herd. And Ezra, the Bible teacher, and his 13 Levites and 13 other buddies, and they built a special platform just so it could be done well, feed the herd. Uh, Nehemiah had solidarity with others. He didn't try to do this alone. Chapter 9 is one of the most beautiful prayers in all of the Bible. It's one of the longest prayers in the Bible. And Nehemiah just emotionally owns. Just look at all the us and the hour. And the, it's, he does this in community. He realizes that all of this well, involves all of God's people, and I'm one of those people. He has a solidarity with the people. And Nehemiah kept to the code. Nehemiah kept to the code. He, he, there are certain, certain things that are right. And if you, you weren't a Levite, then you weren't going to serve in the temple. No way. There are certain things right and certain things wrong. And that won't change. And Nehemiah, for being the guy who pulled other people's hair out, was celebratory. 
When they brought the choir up on this side of the wall, and they brought the other choir up on this side of the wall, they sang, and the Bible says, and the people's voice could be heard from far away. I bet it was quite a party. I asked myself as I probed this book, and as I thought about cowboys, about my dear friend Doug Aldridge, and I thought to myself, here's a tough and tender guy. I've seen him said, say to some of you students, no, the answer is no. You can't substitute basket weaving for Greek. <laughs> no. But I've seen him cry from the chapel stage as he talked about being a paramedic and saving somebody on the highway from their physical death, but not thinking far enough. Sometimes we just don't think long enough about their eternity and their soul. Here's a fifth academic dean of this school who's tough and tender. He knows how to balance that. Here's an academic dean who makes good plans. I mean, good grief, I've only been gone a year. But when I look at the compass, I just, every page, I just go, oh, man. This, look at all these new programs. Look at all these new things. Look, this is great. Should have left 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes he's not afraid to push back on the opposition. Uh, he just doesn't buy every hermeneutical construct. And he has some political convictions that he's not willing to give up either. He faces the opposition. And he, um, he works hard. His productivity embarrasses me. I remember when we were getting ready to do the self-study for our most recent credit, accreditation reaffirmation. The jobs were kind of passed out by Doug Miller. <laughs> and, you know, in two weeks, Doug had his done. The rest of us were trying to find where we put them. Where, where, where are those plants? Tremendously productive. He works hard. He's willing to personally sacrifice. You don't know this. I, I bet you David McMillan and Donna Richardson are the only people who know this, besides me. But the faculty students, when they go out, they turn in travel reports. And Doug, as you know, did a lot of cowboy camps. And uh, many times... He would choose to take his family instead of fly, so they drove. But when he would turn in his travel report, he would say, just give me what the plane ticket would have been, not the gas mileage, which would have been far more. See, you don't know that. I know that. He's willing to make personal sacrifice. And he wants to feed the herd. Is that okay for me to call you a herd? <laughs> he wants to feed the... He knows, as those others who have served in this chair knew, that it is the power of this story and this book that will breathe life into people. He, he gets this. He wants to make sure that this is exposed. And I just have to take a little bit of a tangent and tell you how deeply I feel about this, that I know he feels about this. We have these ministry meetings like you always have in located ministry. And one day I went downtown just north of Sports Authority Field at Mile High, a little right across the street from the Denver Aquarium, and went to this little dump called the El Senor Soul. That's where we had our minister's meeting. I was really glad I went that day because Ben Marinus from Eastern European Mission was speaking. I'd never met him before, but he told the train story. Oh my, I went up to him afterwards and I said, Ben, I'm going to Orlando in July. i got to have that story. He said, I'll send it to you. And the train story is all about the power of this word. Uh, this train story concerned Lynn Camp, who was and is the president of Eastern European Mission. And it took place in 1961, before the fall of the wall. And... Uh, here came Ivan Martus from Budapest, riding the train to Vienna in Austria. And Lynn Camp from Eastern European Mission meets Ivan Martus. And they learned that Ivan is a banker 
behind the Iron Curtain and he's a Christian, so maybe we can smuggle Bibles and Christian literature through Ivan back behind the Iron Curtain. And they began to do that. One day, Lynn Camp went to pick up Ivan from the train station in Austria in Vienna. And when Ivan got off the train, his face was fallen. And Lynn Camp said, Ivan, what's wrong? And he told him the story that as the train was going along, the guards came through. He said, they inspected our paperwork. All my paperwork was in good condition. And then he said, I made the fatal error of opening up my briefcase, and there was my Bible. And the guard took the Bible, and he began, you are a banker, and you believe this crazy book? And he began to chide him in front of others, and then the guard did a drastic thing. He chucked that Bible right out the window of a moving train. Ivan was devastated. I would be. I got lots of little notes in this thing. And so Lynn said, I'm so sorry. They prayed. Fast forward two years. Ivan gets off the train once again from Budapest in Vienna, in Austria, and there he's just smiling. And Lynn Kemp says, well, you look happy today. What's going on? He said, a couple days ago, a package arrived in the mail. He said, it was my Bible. It had his name and address, you know, in the front, how you do. And he said some kids were playing alongside of the tracks. And they uh, found the Bible and they took it home to the village and nobody knew what it was. Finally, a grandma said, I think that's a Bible. And the village gathered. And they wrote him this note as they sent the Bible back in the package. Dear Mr. Martis. We're so sorry for keeping your Bible these two years. But it took us that long to make several handwritten copies. And oh, by the way, 30 of us have baptized each other. I happen to know what this 15 believes about this story. And he wants to feed every one of you. He, this cowboy has a great solidarity with others. You know what was very fun was watching him preside at faculty meetings when either I was, you know, having to slip away early or something and watch the interaction. And sometimes you just like to kind of, you know, watch the room. And I watched how the team members responded to him. He understands something about solidarity. And he understands something about the cowboy code. He knows like in Nehemiah 10 and 11 and 12, there are some things that are right and there are some things that are just flat wrong. And a fallen world needs to step up to the plate and recognize that. And then he is actually a pretty celebratory guy. I was out of town when Doug and George's older boy Doug got married. I, I didn't know that their son Garrett just got married till tonight. But I was told by my wife, who's a pretty reliable source about things like this, that Doug and Georgia could tear a rug or a barn, uh, a little two-step or something there. I know you won't tell anybody that except right here. Um, I don't know if he remembers this, but I remember this. We were at the North American Christian Convention, and we were out in the hallway after a workshop, and I said to Doug Aldridge, I sure wish you'd think about maybe coming back and teaching someday. I've said very few smart things in my life, but that was one of them. But the better thing was when he said at the invitation of the trustee board, yes, we'll come. Would you please join me in welcoming to this stage the fifth dean of Ozark Christian College, Doug Aldridge.
I would keep calling Mark Scott. Thank you so much, Brother Scott. I really do appreciate it, boy. Thank you, guys. It was January 19th, 1992. I'm in First Christian Church in Carthage, Missouri, and it's the invitation time, and God is working on my heart like crazy. See, God had been working on my heart. In fact, he really spoke to me the week before when I was out feeding cattle. And I really was. And I had on KOBC and the song came out, Rich Mullins' old song, Step by Step, You'll Lead Me and I Will Follow You Wherever You Go. And I was kind of just caught myself singing that and feeding the cattle. And, and I just heard God speak to me, really? You'll do that? You see, God had been working on me a lot. A friend of mine had attended the National Missionary Convention the previous fall and had bought the book, In the Shadow of the Almighty. It's a biography of the life of the missionary Jim Elliott. Most of you might know, or some of you might know, that Jim Elliott was killed along with four other guys on January 8, 1956. They were, trying, they were taking the gospel to the Alka Indians in Ecuador. And as I just read that book and I read his life story, it just, it just God spoke to my heart. Here I saw this sold out guy from high school on. He was sold out for Jesus. In fact, there were journal entries in that book from when he was 19 years old, a college student at Wheaton College in Illinois, and he would just write out his prayers. A prayer is like, Father, light these idle sticks of my life that I may burn up for thee. Consume my flesh, my God, it is thine. And I remember... I started praying that prayer. It's kind of a scary prayer. You know, God answers those prayers like right now, consume my flesh. He'll start. You pray for a new pickup, takes forever. You pray that God consumes your flesh. And he starts, I mean, he answers that right now. He had another prayer at 19 where he said, Father, make of me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road, but make me a fork that men might turn one way or another on facing Christ and me. And as I prayed those prayers, and as I sought the Lord, I realized I needed to repent I needed to be consumed by God. I needed to be a fork in the road. And like Nehemiah, I realized that if the temple was ever going to be rebuilt, I needed to get my life right with God first. And so as the sermon came to a close, my cues preaching out of John chapter 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. Jesus said, and if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. I was being so convicted by God. It came to the decision time, and it was one of those moments where the Holy Spirit is just tugging on you and convicting, like, you know, you need to make a decision. And the preacher, you know, oftentimes he would say, if you want to come forward and confess Christ and be baptized, come forward and do that. Or if you want to rededicate your life to Christ, you can do that. And then he threw this one in. He never threw this one in. And he said, if God is speaking to some of you, about answering his call to full-time vocational ministry, you need to make that decision. And you see, that was me that morning. And so, you know, they're singing the invitation song. God is just, you know, pulling on me the spirit. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to go forward. The song's almost over. I'm going to milk it. I can milk this decision for another year. I've done that before. You know, I'll just change. I'll just keep it to myself. No, no, God, I will. And my beautiful wife, Georgia, looks at me and she says, God, or God, she said, no, she has to call me God. <laughs> well, <laughs> we do things a little different in the cowboy culture. <laughs> she says, Doug, is God trying to tell you something? And I look at her, I look at her, and I said, no. <laughs> I, I mean, the song, the invitation song was almost over. And so it was done, and then the worship leader, I hate when you guys do this, you guys that really feel conviction, you know, called the worship, don't do this. He says, let's sing another round. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and it just goes, so the song goes, and I feel God just convicting me to make a decision, and I'm not going to do it. I mean, I know I should, but I don't know, I don't like this decision song anyway, whatever it was. <laughs> and Georgia looks at me again, and she says, Doug, are you sure? And I was like, I can't lie to my wife twice. You know, I got standards, you know. So, I just like, oh, gosh. And so I just go down the aisle. I stand up there. 
And I'm just like, yeah, God's calling me to minister. You guys, we had just built a brand new house. Brand new. We had only lived in it 10 months. I built the thing. I had a lot of sweat and blood in that house. And we had to, like, sell it and everything. And we moved to Ozark Christian College. And it was just amazing. See, that decision brought me to Ozark Christian College in the fall of 1992. In fact, it was 20 years ago, 20 years ago, I was sitting out there at one of these tables in this building as a freshman. I mean, I was older. I was, you know, 28 years old. I had went to school before at Cal State University in Chico and, and went to paramedic school. I had done other things, but I really feel convicted. God wanted me here. I was older. In fact, back then, they called us prime students that stood for people realizing inward maturity excellence yeah i'm glad we got rid of that you know <laughs> now we just call it non-traditional student but i was a prime student and i'm sitting there and i knew god wanted me here you guys but i did not realize what it would mean for my life because at ozark christian college i found a place consumed by God, a place that was indeed a fork in the road. I remember going to Mark Scott's ex class, first class, first semester. Well, I had 7 o'clock Old Testament history with Wilbur Fields at 8 o'clock ex class with Mark Scott. And it just rocked my world. I mean, we just learned about Jesus and the church and I fell in love with my Savior even more. And I remember going home even, and, and something would happen in the dorm apartment. Oh, my wife and I, we were hired as dorm parents of Williamson Hall. I mean, the same time. And, and I remember going into something you know normally would have upset me, and I didn't get upset. And my wife was even surprised that I wouldn't get upset. And I was like, huh, I'm studying about Jesus. I'm not getting upset anymore. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> this was a fork in the road. A place committed to raising up servant leaders, of evangelizing the lost and edifying Christians worldwide. A place where the academic mission, our academic mission in the classroom is that students become like Christ and serve like Christ. This is a Jesus school. We want you to become more like Christ and live like Christ. That's what every classroom is about. A place where who we teach you to love is more important than what we teach you to know. A place where spiritual giants like Seth Wilson and Lynn Gardner and Mark Scott humbly serve the Lord. And as the fifth academic dean, I promise to continue in that tradition. To have Ozark Christian College be a school that produces students who are biblically grounded and spiritually mature and culturally relevant to keep the Bible as our primary textbook, to raise up students who will seek the Lord, who will repent and confess their sin and then go rebuild the temple by serving the church and loving the church. You know, one of the responsibilities I have as the dean and even as the assistant dean under Mark Scott is to conduct senior exit interviews. And so, you know, once you matriculate through and do your, well, even associate's degree, if you do your two years or your three years for the advanced associates or four years for the Bachelor of Arts or five years for the Bachelor of Theology, when you graduate, the semester right at the end before you graduate, we conduct a senior exit interview and we ask you questions like, where are we strong and where are we weak and how can we improve and did we accomplish our mission and our objectives in your life? And, and then we just ask, hey, is there anything else you want to share at Ozark Christian College? And I remember... The senior saying, you know, no, God really blessed me. This is a cool place. In fact, if he said, if you come to Ozark Christian College and fit in, you will be changed. And what he meant by that is if you come to Ozark Christian College and embrace our mission and go to class and do the reading and worship God and go to life groups. And if you embrace everything that we have here, you will indeed be consumed by God. It will be a fork in the road for you. But if you come here and don't take advantage of the time, if you skip class and skip chapel and don't go to life groups and skip dorm devos and don't get involved in a local church, you might not be changed. You might, to you, it might be, oh, that place isn't consumed by God. I don't know what he was talking about. No, but like Nehemiah, no, no, you need to repent. You need to seek the Lord. And when you do that, you will be changed. You see, the way that you fit in at Ozark Christian College is by following the words of Jesus, 
who said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Get the deny yourself part? Or the words of John the Baptist who said, he must become greater and I must become less. Or Pastor Bonhoeffer who wrote, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Or the devotional writer A.W. Tozer who once wrote, I used to think God's gifts were stacked on shelves one above the other. And the higher I reached, the more I got. But I now realize that God's gifts are stacked on shelves one beneath the other. And the lower we stoop, the more we get, the more we make ourselves a servant. Or Jim Elliott, at 19 years old, who wrote this in his journal, he would pray through scripture and then he would comment, and he's noting a verse that has often been sung in corporate assembly in the church, Psalm 100, verse 4. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Then he notes Psalm 100 verse 3, the context, the previous verse. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And thus he comments, What are those sheep doing going into the gate? What is their purpose inside those courts? To bleat melodies and enjoy the company of the flock? No. Those sheep were destined for the altar. Their pasture feeding had been for one purpose, to test them and fatten them for bloody sacrifice. Give him thanks then that you have been counted worthy of its altars. Enter into his work with praise. See, I hope you're getting the point. In order to seek the Lord like, Jer uh, like Nehemiah, you have to deny yourself. And it is my prayer that this year and every year that you are here at Ozark Christian College, we will give you all kinds of opportunities to deny yourself. See, that's how you become holy. That's how by denying yourself and following Christ. Because in the upside down nature of the kingdom of God, that is how you will become a fork in the road. That is how you will become consumed by God, and that is how you will fit in at Ozark Christian College. Let me pray. Holy Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much for Brother Scott. I thank you for the heritage of the school. I thank you for Seth Wilson and Wallace Wardick and Lynn Gardner and Mark Scott. Father, help me be faithful to your word. May we be a school that glorifies you first and foremost, God. May this year we commit to you. May we take opportunities to deny ourselves and become more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your grace and love and empowering with your, us with your Holy Spirit to live a life worthy of the calling we've received in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I'm going to call Dr. Bob Arntz to the stage. I also want to ask any of our trustees who are here with us, and I know that we have some, if you would come to the stage right now as well, any of our trustees, uh, please come to the stage. I also want to invite um, Dr. Scott, if you would come on up, and uh, Dr. Gardner, if you're able, we would love to have you join us here on the stage as well. As they're coming, um, let me just crack the door a little bit on the administrative offices at Ozark Christian College. Um, Dr. Mark Scott informed the Board of Trustees uh, back in August of 2010 that the 2010-2011 school year would be his last uh, year at Ozark Christian College after uh, 27 years of service here. And um, Mark uh, was accepting a call to a church in Colorado. Uh, he's a preacher at heart, as uh, many of you know, and he wanted to get back into the local church to preach and to teach. And so during that 2010-2011 school year, um, our board of trustees took the search for the next academic dean uh, very seriously. Um, as I mentioned there, at that point, had only been four in our almost 70-year history. We don't just do this every day. And it's an important role. At Ozark Christian College, we're a little different than other schools. Many 
colleges and universities would uh, tell you that they are president-led. Our history has been that we are led by the president and the academic dean. We believe strongly in shared leadership here at Ozark. And so the twin leadership engines here, if you will, at the school have always been the president and the academic dean in tandem, in, in yoke together. And so this is a key leadership role. So our trustee board began um, to pray. In fact, they took one day every month uh, for that school year to fast and to pray, ask God to guide us. And at the end of that school year, still seeking God's guidance, we had talked to Doug Aldrich, who was serving as the assistant academic dean, and asked him if he would uh, become the interim academic dean. And he agreed to do that for the 2011-2012 school year. And uh, last year, it became evident to all of us, to the Board of Trustees, certainly. In fact, we already knew. But it became evident to Doug as well that God had raised him up for just such a time as this. He was the man for the job. And so we had an opportunity to talk with him and uh, with his sweet wife, Georgia, in the trustee meeting. And uh, honestly, I, I'm so glad that, that Mark recognized Georgia. You understand, Georgia led him to the Lord. Um, that's why he was in the kingdom. And as you just heard, uh, she's the one that shoved him out of the pew and got him down the aisle. <laughs> And she has been faithfully at his side, and we're grateful for you, Miss Georgia. And, and they sat in that interview with the trustee board, and uh, everyone came out of that meeting confident that this, this was the Holy Spirit's leading. I want to tell you that now Doug Aldridge has my full confidence. He has the full confidence of the trustee board. He has the full confidence of the faculty. And so uh, this is a special evening as we install him as the fifth academic dean. I'm gonna turn the microphone over here in just a moment to Dr. Bob Arntz, the chairman of our board of trustees. And on the back of your white order of service, you will see that there are vows of commitment. And you can read along. Dr. Arntz will uh, lead through those. And then after these vows of commitment have been made, um, the trustees and uh, Drs. Scott and Gardner are going to gather around uh, Doug, and we're going to uh, pray a prayer of consecration for him. Uh, so you listen right now. Ozark Christian College exists to train men and women for Christian service, and the academic dean plays a key role in the administration and leadership of such a college. Along with the president, the dean ensures the college's doctrinal faithfulness, recruits and equips a quality faculty, fosters academic excellence, oversees curriculum development, and guards the college's historical mission. With God as your help, will you work to keep this college true to the word of God, protecting it from false doctrine, and contending for the faith once for all entrusted to the saints? I will. With God as your help, will you work to keep this college faithful to Jesus Christ, centered on him as the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, the head of the church, the Lord of heaven and earth, and the hope of every believer? I will. With God as your help, will you work to keep the Great Commission as the heartbeat of this college, challenging us to make disciples of all nations, and guarding our mission of training men and women to serve Christ and his church? I will. With God as your help, will you work with the board and administration to recruit a faculty with these same commitments to develop them as believers and teachers and to shepherd those who shepherd our students? I will. With God as your help, will you work to develop an academic program that equips students with this, these same commitments, sound knowledge of God's word, committed faith in Jesus Christ, and a desire to advance his worldwide kingdom while fostering the culture and resources needed for the academic excellence. I will. With God as your help, will you work to set a personal example of faith, love, and purity, watching your own life and doctrine closely, being diligent in all these matters and, and persevering in them? I will. Upon your vows of commitment to fulfill the offices and as chairman of the board of trustees, 
I do hereby install you as the fifth academic dean of Ozark Christian College. On behalf of the board, I promise you every possible, every help possible to assure you success in this work. And along with the college family, I commit to pray for you, asking God to bless you with his wisdom, strength, and love. Let's all just gather together right now and, uh, and pray for Doug. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Doug and for Georgia, and we thank you for their commitment to this college. We thank you that uh, you have brought them to us. Lord, we pray that you would give Doug wisdom in his new role, uh, put people around him that uh, are also wise in counsel, uh, guard his heart, Lord, and guard the purpose uh, of his duties here at, at Ozark. And uh, Father, we just thank you uh, for this fine man and, and pray that uh, you would be with him in all his endeavors. In Jesus' name. This time I'm going to ask Chad Ragsdale and Sean Lindsay to come to the stage. And I'm also going to ask all of our faculty here at Ozark, if you would, come down and line yourselves along uh, the front of the stage as we prepare to make this faculty pledge after we are led as a faculty by Chad and Sean in this pledge. Then I'm just going to ask Christy and Chad to come right up and to lead you all in your student pledge. And by the way, that student pledge is not something that was drawn up by us as faculty members or an administration. It was actually drawn up by you as students, your representatives, the Student Advisory Council uh, put that pledge together. And so you'll make that to close out the evening. Chad and Sean. faculty finish making their way up front, let me, let me just say this, that as your faculty, we love you, and we see you as a sacred trust, and as a way to demonstrate our commitment publicly to being stewards of that sacred trust, we make this pledge, I turn over the page, in our effort to bring glory to God, we will teach with conviction grounded in